Hello and welcome to this film um, about the periodic table. It's the first in a series of six films from the standard level periodicity topic and hopefully by the end of this film um, you'll have some idea of how the periodic table that we know today has evolved from some earlier incarnations and you'll also know that the groups and periods that we see in today's periodic table are related to where the electrons are found in an atom and as well as those things we'll also have a look at um, some particular families of elements who we've given certain names to and, and we'll see where they're found in the periodic table. Okay, let's start off by introducing a couple of uh, very influential figures in the development of the periodic table. They're John Newlands and uh, Dmitry Menelaev, uh, a British and a Russian chemist respectively. Now they were both working in the mid to late um, 19th century and what they were kind of spotting was that if they arranged all the elements that had been discovered in order of their atomic weights that there were certain repeating patterns that were coming up so for example Newlands in his periodic table at which he kind of he was talking about these laws of octaves so in other words every eight elements he found that there was some repetition he was finding that so for example if he arranged them in, the term, in terms of atomic weight, fluorine and chlorine would have similar chemical properties, and so would every eighth element. Okay, so he was calling this the law of octaves because there was a repetition every eight elements. Mendeleev, um, kind of, well, I suppose he was working around the same time, and they were kind of in competition with one another in in a way. But his ideas gained credibility. Um, sometime after he came up with them I suppose you could say um, because he actually left some gaps for undiscovered elements because he was saying well we don't have an element say that belongs in this group at the moment but perhaps we'll discover one later and if we do then we ought to have this such and such properties and such and such atomic weight so the power of Mendeleev's table was not only the fact that he'd kind of found a nice way of arranging atoms but also that there was some predictive power Okay, it allowed us to think, oh, well, maybe there's other elements we haven't discovered yet, and here's what they might behave like. And when that was proved right, it, you know, it, it, um, it suggested that Mendeleev had really hit on something. So now if we look at today's version, I found this one um, whilst looking for some image, images of the periodic table. This is quite an interesting one, talking about uh, the nationalities of... Uh, the discoverers of all the elements. You can see that Britain features quite prominently, as does Russia and Germany, um, and Sweden, in fact. But anyway, um, normally we don't see all these flags on the periodic table. Normally it's this kind of arrangement, which we're hopefully fairly familiar with. And um, what we could also do is arrange the periodic table in a slightly different way largely the same as the ones we've just been looking at except this region here has seemingly been stuck in between these two regions now if you arrange all the atoms in order of their atomic weight then and in terms of their properties and you pay some attention to their electron configurations you end up with this very very long periodic table which doesn't fit very well on a piece of A4 paper and because we use A4 paper quite a lot we normally end up with something like this where we can see that that group that block of elements called the F block you don't need to know too much about what F block means in the standard level course but the, the lanthanides and the actinides they're kind of taken out of there and put down here um, just to make the the table fit onto a piece of paper a bit better. Now what this table here also highlights quite nicely is the fact that we've got certain regions of the periodic table that have certain names okay and there are some of these that are quite important to remember. So group one here, group one is known as the alkali metals okay so that's one of the important ones to remember the alkali metals. Um, it's not uncommon to see um, people talking about the alkaline earth metals as well. Um, this tends to be called the transition metals, this region here in the middle, which remember is kind of is not including these. Okay, and another very, very commonly referred to group is the 
halogens over here in group 7 or 17, depending on what you call that group. Okay, It should really be called 17, but a lot of people call it group 7 because they're thinking of the, what are called the main groups. But anyway, 7 or 17. And then finally, the noble gases here in the furthest right-hand group, or group 0 or group 8 or group 18. Okay, so try and remember where the alkali metals and the alkaline earths and the halogens and the noble gases are found in the periodic table. And it's also good to know what we mean when we're talking about the transition metals or the d-block elements here in the middle. In, the, in this particular table, they're marked yellow. Okay, um, we'll move on now to looking at um, what information we can get about electrons from our periodic table. Now if we take um, a certain element as an example, maybe calcium, we know that calcium is element number 20, we know that it must have therefore 20 electrons, and because we know that 2 fit in the first shell, and 8 fit in the second, and 8 fit in the third, although that's a little white lie, then there must be 2 in the fourth shell. Okay, So in other words, I can figure out calcium's electron configuration by just counting electrons. But there's a little bit of a shortcut that we can use if we've got a periodic table in front of us as to deciding how many shells there are in calcium. And we can see there's four here. And what's more, we can decide how many electrons there are in its outer shell. Because remember, in chemistry, really and truly, it's these valence electrons, the ones that are in the outer shell, that are most important to us. Okay, So because calcium is in group 2, so the groups are the columns. Because calcium is in group 2, it's got two valence electrons. Because it's in the fourth period, so these are the rows, and be careful that you don't miss out this very short row. It does get counted. Okay, but often people will start counting from here because they've forgotten about this top row. Often because hydrogen's not here, it's sometimes put somewhere else, so it looks like this is the first row when you look at the left-hand side. Anyway, because calcium is in the fourth row, that tells us it's in the fourth period, that is to say, it means it's got four filled electron shells. Not necessarily completely filled, in the case of the last one, but four shells have got electrons in. Okay, so that's a way that we can use the groups and the periods to quickly tell us how many electron shells have got electrons in and how many electrons there are in the outermost shell of the atom. Okay, um, so we've come to the end of the film and hopefully, although it's not tested, you know something about the fact that the, um, the current periodic table has, has evolved from earlier versions. Um, that you also know that the uh, groups and periods in a periodic table are the columns and rows respectively and they tell us about the number of shells and um, number of valence electrons in an atom and you also know the names of some of the regions of the periodic table like the alkali metals and so on and so forth. Okay, So if there's anything confusing there, hopefully it's not because it's kind of just factual information, um, but if there is then please feel free to comment um, or to come and see me and, and discuss any questions that you might have.